Thank you. For the first thing I want to say is that if English is not your first language, I very much appreciate it that I can speak to you in English and you'll understand me. I really appreciate that because I, I don't know one word of Danish. So I really appreciate that. Um, someone said to me, well, you know, just a couple of days ago, they said, you know, it seems to me that people in the United States are kind of obsessed with the concept of freedom. And, and what I thought to myself is, but aren't we all? I mean, isn't this the nature of the human being to be free? And even though, of course, it's like Dylan said, Bob Dylan, uh, are birds free from the chains of the Skyway? No, of course not. We are, you know, we are, uh, you know, we are subject to the natural laws. But the laws of man should not be used to subjugate human beings. We are free. So what I'm going to be talking about is United Nations Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. And I'm sure, unlike people in the United States, you may have heard about this global agreement. But uh, in the United States, anyone who talks about it is considered to be and labeled a conspiracy theorist, an extremist, um, kind of a nut, right? And they, the press will malign you. In fact, up until very recently, the press denied, the United States press and the world press denied that Agenda 21 exists. But it does. It exists. And it is the blueprint. It is the action plan to inventory and control all land, all water, all minerals, all plants, all animals, all means of production, all construction, all energy, all education, all information, and all human beings in the world. Inventory and control. The action plan. Okay. It's the real deal. It's a transition from representative government to government governance, governance by unelected boards and commissions. It's the erasure of jurisdictional boundaries and the loss of private property rights. And ultimately, you need to know that this, your body, is your most important private property, your body and your mind. So, um, you know, ultimately, it leads to the loss of sovereignty and freedom for all of us. So, of course, you're going to be concerned about this, not just as citizens of whatever nation you live in, but as free human beings. And this, of course, is a nonpartisan issue. So, United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development was agreed to uh, by 179 nations, including the United States and Denmark, in 1992 at the UN Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. In the U.S., George H.W. Bush committed us to implementing sustainable development, and it's been supported by every president ever since. Bush, Clinton, baby Bush, and Obama. This is a global plan, but it is implemented locally. So it gives the illusion of being a grassroots movement, but it is not. United Nations Agenda 21 Sustainable Development is the biggest public relations scam in the history of the world. But it's far more than that. It's the agenda for the 21st century. That's what it's called by the UN. And it's a recipe for destruction. It enables and justifies monitoring and metering and restricting our energy usage and our water usage. And you see that, of course, as smart meters. Instituting a carbon tax on industry and ultimately on us as individuals. Pulverizing our roads and destroying our dams. Instituting data collection and data sharing, information sharing in energy usage, schools, healthcare, 
law enforcement, and in fact, in every part of our lives that had formerly been private. Diagnosing a huge portion of our population with mental illness and drugging us. It enables the revamping of our school systems by inserting sustainable development principles into every course, from pre-kindergarten all the way to post-graduate school. So by the way, if you're looking to the young generation to save us, you are looking at the resistance here. We must resist and work together. People are being indoctrinated in the school systems to support the principles of sustainable development. What else does it do? It enables the changing of every land use document in the world to require high density development, high density housing in city centers so that we can be more easily managed, controlled, and surveilled. It allows for warrantless searches and domestic surveillance. And, hey, in the, U in the U.S., we are now, under the U.S. Patriot Act, we can be identified as potential enemy combatants, and we see the redefinition of torture. It allows for the loss of personal and national sovereignty, in a global transfer to megacorporations. This is the erection of a corporatocracy. That's what it is. It's a global totalitarian state, and it is in progress right now. This is not something that's out there in the future, or it's not here in Denmark, or it's nothing to worry about. This is happening right now. This is what it looks like. It is incremental. That's how it works. It's no flashing lights. You're not going to see it named that very often. It's a stealth plan right out there in plain sight. And it sounds crazy, and it is crazy, but I'm not crazy. I guarantee you. So there's an overarching political and social philosophy that goes with this plan, and it's communitarianism. All over the world, and certainly in the United States, our individual rights are paramount. Now, that doesn't mean that you can go and transgress on someone else, but it means that the individual's rights are guaranteed. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, who's going to define what the pursuit of happiness is? But this is all individuals know this for themselves, right? But under communitarianism, the individual's rights are balanced with the rights of the community. Now, there are no rights of the community, and the community itself is not delineated. You know, what is the community? If you dissent, I guarantee you, you are not the community. The community is whatever those who are in control define it as, as long as it is in support of those plans. So, I'm going to give you an example. It's all for the common good. This is what you'll hear. It's all for the common good. So here's a way to think about this, okay? If you have your, we're going to do a visual here, okay? I'm going to take a clear pitcher of water, a clear glass of water, a glass of water. This is your individual rights, okay? Your individual rights, clear glass of water. Put it down here. Now we're going to take a glass of milk. This is a communitarian state, communitarian rights, Nazi Germany, Soviet Russia, Maoist China. This is the all for the common good, okay? We're going to put that down. Now we're going to balance those rights. We're going to take a clear glass pitcher. We're going to take your individual rights and the rights of the community. We're going to balance them. We're going to pour them together. What do you have? You've got milk. You have subsumed your individual rights into the rights of the community. Undelineated can change at any time. Okay? So, United Nations Agenda 21 is dependent on the Hegelian dialectic, and that says that a crisis is posed and a solution, a crisis comes up. Woo. And here's the solution, okay? The balance between these becomes the new normal. Now, that's something that you may never have agreed to, that new normal, if it were not for that crisis, okay? This is a new normal that 
is pressured. The, the acceptance of it is pressured because you have this crisis. So in the case of Agenda 21, we've got two major crises that enable its full implementation. What's the first one? Global warming, right? Global warming, climate change. Yeah, it's serious. The planet's in danger. The sea levels are rising. Life forms are threatened. And it's our fault. I'll give you an example of this culture of emergency that we're living in. This comes out of the lousy newspaper in my area. It says, it's hard to deny that the earth is functioning well over capacity. Like an overworked horse, it's simply a matter of time before the global organism collapses. Oh, feel that. I'm scared. Ooh, our selfish, wasteful, greedy ways have almost destroyed the planet. But what are you going to do? Well, here comes the UN to the rescue, right? They're going to save the planet. 1987, the World Commission on Environment and Development, the Brutland Commission, they came up with a book, it's called Our Common Future. And it defined sustainable development. That was, you know, now everybody thinks they know. You, you know, you can go around, man on the street interview, ask people what's sustainable development. They all, you know, it's, oh, it's cool, man. You know, we're going to live in balance with nature. All right. Okay, here's where it came up. This is sustainable development, the definition. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Hey, that sounds cool, doesn't it? I mean, who could disagree with that? Did your grandparents think, hmm, I'm going to do everything I can to screw up life for my grandkids? <laughs> no, all of us want to continue to live and to make life possible for others and to conserve you know, our environment. This is not about that. This is why I called my book Behind the Green Mask, because this is the mask, okay? So development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. Well, great. All that remained then was to say, yes, indeed, everything we're doing now does compromise the ability of future generations to meet their needs. What are we going to do about it? So the General Assembly of the United Nations said to the World Commission on Environment and Development, hey, can you come back in five years, in 1992, with the action plan, the action plan for sustainable development? And they did. And here it is. The action plan for sustainable development, Earth Summit, Agenda 21, the United Nations Program of Action at Rio. 1992, Rio de Janeiro Earth Summit, 300 pages, 40 chapters. This itself is a green mask. This itself, if you don't know how to read it and what you're looking at, you will, be, uh, you will think that it's just a, a document that talks about how everyone should be concerned about the planet. That is not what this is really about. In fact, the chairman, Maurice Strong, who you're going to remember, Maurice Strong, of course, had to flee to China because of the oil for food scandal. Um, he, was the, uh, he was the chair of the World Commission on Environment and Development in 1992. And he said, what's unsustainable? The middle class lifestyle, the middle class suburban lifestyle, single family residences, private vehicles, appliances, air conditioning, meat eating, Tillage, breaking the Earth's surface, is unsustainable. Okay, so if you're into organic farming, if you're thinking, oh, I'm going to go out there on a nice little piece of land and raise something, tillage is unsustainable. You need a $250,000 seed injection machine because you need to inject those seeds into the earth, right? Well, the optimum way of growing food is going to be in a downtown parking garage. Now, they don't call it that. They have other names for it, but that's what it'll look like, a big structure in the center of your town where your food is grown in a concrete building. That's the optimal. 
Now, there are three E's, the three E's of sustainable development. This is the logo, the image that you're going to see, and this is what you hear, is the three E's, economy, ecology, and equity, social equity. And I'll show you the image for this. It's in here somewhere. You may have seen this. It's the three interlocking circles, right? It's ecology, economy, and social equity. And where they meet in the center, this is all where everything's in balance, and that's sustainable development, okay? So the key provision, it's key to this plan that there be total data collection and information sharing worldwide. Because how else can you monitor whether people are balancing their environment, their economy, and their social equity? It impacts economics, housing, transportation, land use, health, education, water, energy, food production, privacy, and security. Is there anything I missed? Global biodiversity is dependent on creating something called islands of human habitation. Islands of human habitation. This is where we'll be. Dense urban cores surrounded by buffer zones, and corridors for animals. The idea is to collect human beings into concentrated city centers, concentrated centers. So, okay, in 1992, the Earth Summit, 179 nations agreed by consensus to adopt this plan. It's a global plan. The goal was to implement sustainable development in all public and private policies and activities the entire world. How was, the, how was it done? How did they do it? I'll tell you about the U.S. In uh, 1993, when Clinton took office, he created the President's Council on Sustainable Development. And this is, all the countries did this, they all created their local Agenda 21 to implement it locally. Okay, so what, who was on that? You need to hear this because you need to see how this all comes together. It's a beautiful, beautiful framework for totalitarian control. So who did they have on that? They had 10 cabinet-level secretaries, defense, interior, agriculture, education, transportation, and captains of industry like Enron, Ken Lay was on the President's Council on Sustainable Development, uh, BP, British Petroleum, DuPont, Dow Chemical, Siba Geigy, Sandoz, Novartis, was on the President's Council on Sustainable Development. What do they do? They provide vaccines. What else? Hypertension drugs and Ritalin for children. Who else was on there? Nonprofit organizations like the World Resources Defense Fund, the Natural, National Natural Resources Defense Fund, the World Wildlife Fund and Council, the Sierra Club. Okay, so what this does is it brings nonprofits, government, and corporations together to implement policy because the idea was that this plan could be implemented administratively all over the world without us knowing about it. So how were they going to do it? They were going to use and are using land use plans because this is the way to control the population is by controlling land. So in 1996, the President's Council on Sustainable Development in the U.S. gave a multi-million dollar grant to the American Planning Association to come up with a book now, it's a 12-pound book, so I didn't bring it with me. It's called Growing Smart, Legislative Guidebook with Model Statutes for Planning and the Management of Change. Change. Now, think about that word change. You don't have change without destruction. Transformation requires destruction of the old way. Now, that word change was used in the Obama administration is still being used along with the word forward. Change and forward without asking change to what? Forward to what? 
and what does that mean? So here we go. We've got a legislative guidebook that is now in every university if you're studying planning and every single planning department in the entire nation that is guiding every planning department with sustainable development principles. So they said, hey, we can, we're going to be able to do this. We're going to make this thing happen. And we can implement this without the people knowing, but when they find out that they're living in a dictatorship, they might not be happy. So it might be unpopular. So what are they going to do? So they came up with another book. It's called Sustainable America, A New Consensus. So you know the word consensus. If you look up consensus in a dictionary, hey, if we were going to have consensus in here, we'd all be in a big circle, we'd talk, we'd, you know, let's say we're going to go party tonight. So we're going to talk about it, we're going to decide where we want to go, and everybody's going to get a chance to, you know, we're going to work it out, right? That's real consensus, agreement of all parties. No, no, no. This is the new consensus. What is it? What is the definition? The new consensus is neutralization of the opposition. Neutralizing your enemies. Neutralize and convert. You dare to dissent? Agenda 21 is top-down, global, but it gives the illusion of being local, right? So it purports to being sourced in the people, and it needs support by the stakeholders. Mm, you think you're a stakeholder. You are not a stakeholder. Okay? They need community buy-in, so they create it. In fact, they create the community. In fact, your local government is engaged. Now, you know, does this sound like, hey, this, this is a conspiracy, but it ain't no theory. This is the real deal. So your local government will go out into your neighborhoods and identify people who are willing to work with them, and then they will elevate them. They'll say, hey, have you thought about starting a neighborhood association? And then there's that person who's speaking for you. Well, you're cooking dinner, and you're hanging out, and you're doing other things. You don't even know that person exists, but they are helping to make policy for what happens to you in your town right now. So they create, they create community, they use nonprofits, civil society, unelected boards, and they create these groups. Nonprofits, non-governmental organizations are at the bottom level of this bureaucracy. This is a bureaucracy that is created where we have no impact. This is not representative. Right? So they have public opinion meetings. They call them visioning meetings in the United States. This is all across the U.S. You get invited to come on down, give your opinion of this cool new plan for the center of town. So you go. You go down there. And they've got a screen up there, and they show, you know, do you like this? Do you like that? They give you three options. You don't like any of them, but you don't get to say that. And if you do say that, well, you're a dissenter. Remember communitarianism. They'll shame you. They'll mock you. You'll be rejected by your community. Half the time, the people in that room are being paid to be there. They are people who are working with a nonprofit. They're consultants. They're employees of the government who are there after hours being paid. And you have wandered in, somehow you noticed that little tiny ad in the newspaper on page 7050. So you ended up in there, right? But right now, if you go to those government meetings, they use the RAND technique, the Delphi technique, a mind control technique, which is used to bring groups of people to a predetermined outcome while giving them the impression that it was all their idea. You are so smart. You came up with that plan all by yourself. We won't tell you it's the same plan in every single city in the entire United States and around the world. If you dissent, they bring, hey, they bring in men with guns. There are now men with guns in, all, in every government city meeting that the public is invited to. Men with guns ring the walls. They're called police officers. I've been chased down an aisle when I had a mic when I was 
you know, giving my opinion, <laughs> you can imagine, and uh, chased by a police officer. I said, what are you going to do? Arrest me for saying something? You afraid I'm going to say something? Mm. You're going to see, okay, so this is it. You're going to see these terms, and they all sound cool. This is all straight out of Agenda 21. Capacity building, strengthening community, consensus building, vibrant, walkable, transformation, livable, change. Ooh, God, it feels good, doesn't it? Yes, this is it. This is manufactured consensus and behavioral modification. This is public re-education. Lifelong learning, you ever see that? Lifelong learning, that's when you go to school as a child and you never stop being indoctrinated. Come on down, we'll give you a class in knitting, and meanwhile we're going to tell you about sustainable development. And it's not about making sure that those sheep are well cared for and eating the right things. It's not about that. It is about manipulating public opinion. It is about opening the populace to accepting decisions made by consensus. So in case you think I'm making this up, I want to show you this. I got this little thing on Amazon. It's, <clears throat> it's, uh, it was published in uh, 1994 or something, and I'm sure that it didn't sell many copies. Now they're just flying off the shelves. I'm sure they're like, what the heck's going on with this? Um, this is called Rescue Mission Planet Earth, a children's guide to Agenda 21. Okay, it's so cute. It's got pictures. It's by the Children of the World and Boutros Boutros Ghali of the UN. Okay? Oh, this is so cute. It's all about how we're messing up the planet. And there's this one little quote I'll tell you. This is for children. The planet groans every time it registers another birth. I'm giving this to my kids. So what else does it say? There's this little booklet in the back. It says, turning Agenda 21 into action is a big challenge for us all. Thousands of people at the United Nations and all over the world are working on it. This booklet will show parents and educators how children can start to be a part of this work. Children are being used are being used. They're being indoctrinated. They're told that they're killing the planet and that they have the power to save it. They're telling the most powerless people on the earth that they have the power to save it, the kind of stress that creates in a human being, right? You're killing the planet. So, you know, there's, there's something very important about what's going on in the educational system right now, and that's that there's no such thing as objective reality. Hey, that's just your opinion. Everybody is entitled to their opinion about how things are. No one's worth more than anyone else. No one's values are more important than anyone else. No one's abilities are more important than anyone else. Of course, no one's more important than anyone else. But no one's reality is real. It's all completely changeable. It's amorphous, even mathematics. Even the certainty of mathematics is now being messed around with by those who are teaching sustainable development. Hey, if you think one plus one equals five, well, let's really think about that. Because, you know, you're valued here and your opinion is important to us. So what this does is it creates that uncertainty about what is real. So when I tell you that what I'm telling you right now is the truth, and you can check it out for yourself, well, hey, that's just my opinion. The idea that, uh, you know, here's the deal. The idea is that life in the suburbs is, uh, and the rural areas, I think your whole country is rural, isn't it? Pretty much, except for Copenhagen and Aarhus and a few other cities. You are a rural nation here in Denmark, and the United States, by the way, is two and a half times the size of Europe and has roughly 60% of the population. Big, big country. There's places you can go out and walk and nobody will find your body for a long time. But we're using up nature. That's what we're being told. So the idea is that life in the suburbs and the rural areas is unsustainable because we produce too many greenhouse gas emissions. With our evil sprawl. 
You live in a house, you got a yard, you're bad. So, it costs too much to get public transportation out to you, you selfish thing, living out there in nowhere, right? So, we're going to bring you into the city centers so that we'll be more sustainable. Dense city centers. We're going to build, using your tax dollars, subsidies, we're going to build smart growth. Now, I don't know if I... Um, let's see, this thing is called growing smart. I don't know if you're familiar with the term smart growth. You're not. Well, in the United States, it is, you trip over it, it's like printed on the street. You can't miss it. Smart growth. Everything's smart, by the way. You got a smartphone, you got a smart yard, you got a smart, 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 smart. Anything that's smart, you better figure it's stupid. You're being manipulated. Smart? So, this is growing smart. We're going to grow smart. We're going to put you in a cell block and paint it a nice color. Okay, so you're in a high-density development. What does that mean? It means apartments or condos on top of shops in the center of town. You've got a bus lane or a bus line out there. Maybe you've got a train. Okay, uh, the building's built right to the edge of the sidewalk. Right to the edge of the sidewalk. Are you running down the street? You did something? You're, in, you're hiding? Where are you going to hide? Nowhere. That building's built right to the edge of the sidewalk. And what do you have? Smiles of those. Around the back in an alley, you've got access for a single car per unit or less. Around in the front, you've got a wide sidewalk so you can uh, have coffee in your little coffee shop. You've got a bike lane. You've got a single lane for cars, trucks, buses, deliveries. And you've got a median strip with some trees in the middle. Oh, your house is burning down? Well, hopefully the emergency vehicles will be able to get through there. So, <clears throat> this is, and then the other side of the street's the same. This is built often with your tax dollars. Infrastructure is built with your tax dollars. These towns are being rezoned and redesigned to high density development. These units, what do you have when you live in a condo? You think you own that? No. The homeowners association owns your butt. You don't, uh, you don't want to pay for the new roof? Well, they're going to lien your house, and you will be paying that. They can raise your homeowners association fees at any time. If you're in an apartment, you're mobile, you can move, you don't consider that you're part of that structure, that part of that life, part of that community. So high-density development, it's not about that building, it is an ideology. It's an ideology that says that if you live in a home, if you have a yard, if you're growing your plants and not in a community garden, if you want private space in your backyard, what are you doing back there? Hey, and you better be on your bike because what do you have in the trunk of that car? Who's in there with you? You might be saying something. Where can you be where you're not being listened to? So, how do they do this? How are they implementing this worldwide? They are using an international group called the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives, ICLE. ICLE. Now, you probably, have you ever heard of ICLE? Ever heard of ICLE? Apps, oh good. There's like one person in here that's heard of ICLE, all right? Why haven't you heard of it? Why haven't you heard of it? 179 cities in Europe are members most major cities in the world are members. That means you are a member. London, Berlin, Madrid, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Rome, Amsterdam, Copenhagen. Are members of the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives. It is a non-governmental organization created to implement Agenda 21 worldwide, to influence policy, it's a stealth organization in 80 countries. It says it gauges livability, and it sells climate action plans. But really what it is, is it's a policy and legislation arm of the United Nations. And it's made up of elected officials, non-governmental organizations, and consultants making policy for you. So this is how it happens. They actually, <laughs> what they do is they concentrate power in the cities, in the large cities. And they slip the power, they slide the power into the control of non-representative boards 
and commissions. And then, for instance, the United States did not sign the Kyoto Treaty. The U.S. did not agree to Kyoto. But 1,055 United States mayors did. They, in fact, agreed to implement, through, through, uh, through ICLE, they agreed to implement the Kyoto Treaty in their cities. And these are major cities in the United States. So what they did is they went around the requirements. They went around the national requirements for ratification of a treaty. And this is how you break jurisdictional boundaries. This is what this is about. So, okay, so what's the goal? Hey, I want to tell you this one thing. Check this out. When Obama was running last time, he said, I'm going to commit the United States to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 80% below 1990 levels. 80% below 1990 levels. Well, that seems like a lot, doesn't it? So I thought, gee, I wonder what year the U.S., will, you know, I wonder what year we were at 90%, 80% of 1990 levels. I've got it. Okay, so I found a chart. I looked at it. Taking the greenhouse gas emissions of the year 2004, okay, that was the chart went up to that, so I found 1990, and then I dropped 80% below that emission and found what year was the United States, what, what year was the world emitting 80% of 1990 levels of greenhouse gas emissions? What year was that? What do you think? 80% below. 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 below 1990 levels. Close, 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 but wrong. 1934, oh, a great year for the world, right in the depths of the Depression, right? Oh, this is cool, we got it all going on. 80% below night, but think about this, do we have more people now than we had in 1934? So, what does that mean? On a per capita basis, you're back in the 1880s, except you can't have a horse because it emits too many greenhouse gas emissions. So you're on a bicycle. This is it. You're on a bike. Okay, the goal is using the green mask of environmental concern. The two parts of Agenda 21 are imposed, and that is smart growth, high-density development, moving populations into controlled city centers where they can be monitored, controlled, and surveilled, and the other part, the Wildlands Project. Wildlands. Getting people off the rural land, blocking access to wilderness roads and resources, and shifting land ownership from private to public. And then when it's in public hands, it can be then shifted into other private hands, conglomerates, large corporations. So that's the way, this is how it's done. In Europe, all the nations made local Agenda 21 plans. All nations. And by the way, if you check out our website, Post Sustainability Institute, uh, you'll find the the link to the United Nations where you can actually find your own country, find the plans, Find, uh, this was updated, the UN updated it. Um, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll give you the information. Don't write it down now. Um, the, what it was was that the United Nations uh, recorded those plans and, and, and actually had everything together on their websites up until about 1997. So you'll see, you know, from, from uh, 1992 to 1997, and yes, Denmark is on there and you can check it out. Um, it c so for instance, here in Denmark, let's just take Denmark, in the year 2000, the Danish Planning Act was amended to commit all municipalities to the development of local Agenda 21 strategies. In, uh, you know, the Earth Summit was, you know, every five years. So in Johannesburg in 2002, what was the goal there? Broadening the role and capacity of local authorities in implementing Agenda 21. Here in Denmark, you've got the Aalborg Agreement in 1994. Aalborg plus 10, 2004, founded the European Local Action 21 Roundtable, public-private partnerships. Fascism. Yeah, that's one of the best ways. That's how do you implement this? 
You use the corporations which pressure the government, work together funding the, no the non-governmental organizations which pressure the government, and then you have people that are shifting from one role to the other. Well, they go out of office and now they're the head of whatever the environmental group is, and then they move from there into another elected position, and this is how your policies are changed. In 2012 was the 20th anniversary of Agenda 21, right? Rio plus 20. And in Rio de Janeiro, it, what was the deal there? Strengthening the role of major groups non-governmental organizations. What did they do there? They say it's a failure. If you check it out with the UN, they're going to tell you, oh, that thing, that failed. We really screwed. They always tell you they failed. They always tell you they failed in their plans because they don't want you to freak out. Yes, we achieved our goal. So, strengthening the role of major groups, what did they do? They made a half a trillion dollars in agreements between non-governmental organizations, foundations, corporations, and governments at that time. The World Business Council for Sustainable Development, who's on that? Monsanto. GM, Sony, DuPont. How about those seeds, huh? Okay, so what you have here, you've got whatever, however you divide your, however you set up your representative government, but in the states we've got city, county, state, and federal. What do they all have in common? <clears throat> They're all elected by you. Now, yeah, they may not represent you, and you might not be happy about it, and you might need a whole heck of a lot of money to get in there, and things are very seriously messed up. But you still have the illusion of electing them, and, and at your local level, you are making policy and electing those officials. But what is this? Think about this. Global, regional, neighborhood. What do they have in common? not representative, you do not elect any of those positions. And that is what we are shifting to. So, if you raise your voice against this, you're a dissenter, right? Communitarianism. Land use and land ownership restrictions are vital, are vital to this plan because they make regionalization possible. And here's what Ernst Huber, the official Nazi Party spokesman, said about this in 1933. Here's the official Nazi policy on land. All property is common property. The owner is bound by the people and the Reich to the responsible management of his goods. His legal position is only justified when he satisfies this responsibility to the community. So big new Brzezinski I think it's ended in 33. Zbigniew Brzezinski is the former national security advisor to President Carter. In 1995, three years after Agenda 21 was agreed to, he said, we cannot leap into world government in one quick step. The precondition for eventual globalization, true globalization, genuine globalization, is progressive regionalization because thereby we, we move towards larger, more stable, more cooperative units, like the EU. Started as a trade agreement. This is how it works. Globalization, if you don't take anything else from this, think about this. Globalization is the standardization of systems. Standardization, you're going to see it as harmonization, hom homogeneity, uniformity. Hey, you can't control systems that don't match up. Systems refer to the legal system, the educational system, healthcare, markets, land use, law enforcement. Do you know about fusion centers? Fusion centers? My goodness, I must be somewhere else. I must not be in the United States. They must not tell you that what they're doing now with law enforcement is integrating, militarizing your local police force, integrating it with your state police, your military, Interpol, the entire world. 
is being completely integrated. Fusion centers, FBI, CIA, all of your records, everything. You cannot fall into those little cracks anymore. Can't happen anymore. Total, seamless information awareness, total awareness. So globalization is the process of developing worldwide uniformity in social, political, economic, and environmental controls. That's what it is. That's globalization. It's the rise of the city-state, okay? This is how you do it. That's what regionalization is, is the rise of the city-state. You're going to lose nations. Now, I'm not, you know, I don't really have time to talk about national, nationalism, but what I want to say is that the smaller the unit, the more power you have. If you get your, if you're regionalized, and you have 200 representatives sitting on an unelected, they're elected, but they're sitting on an unelected board making policy. And let's just say this room, we are all representing some town or some state or some nation? How much voice do we have? Who listens to us? And how much power do we have? So I'm going to show you the new map of the United States of America. And you may not be able to see this very well. We have 50 states in the United States, but this is mega regions. Mega regions. Mega regions. Mega, large, mega regions. These are the city states. These are large cities that are being made larger. Now, remember I told you that the gray area is the wildlands. That's going to be the area that no one will have access to. And you know, I'm a, I, I haven't told you anything about myself. I was a legal witness, an expert witness in land use and land valuation for my government, for the uh, State Department of Transportation, expert witness, testified in court. And I found out about this because I saw that people were not being able to use their land. And I looked behind that, and I found Agenda 21. This is true, OK? The federal government of the United States is doing this, is, part, is, is in process of creating mega regions, which are essentially crossing national boundaries. This is Cascadia. It used to be a portion of Washington State, Oregon State, Idaho, and Vancouver area, British Columbia in Canada. The Southern California and Texas Triangle areas include part of Mexico. This breaks national boundaries, it breaks state boundaries, it breaks county boundaries. It's also a project of the Ford Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Regionalization and world government. You use trade agreements to destroy boundaries, and you actually cannot make local law that breaks those treaties. Okay, you standardize the law, you uh, relocate populations and jobs. We've got the Trans-Pacific Partnership coming up in the United States in the Pacific Rim, and about to come in December is the Transatlantic Trade Investment Partnership with the EU and the United States. The United Nations policy on land use was established in 1976, and it says land. You know, first of all, let me just tell you, if you think nobody owns anything, and hey, aren't we all just cool, this is just the world, this is just life, and oh, nobody can really own anything, and no one's free, I am sorry. That is not true. We do have ownership. We have ownership of this. Our ownership extends to those things that we value. Now, when that is taken away from us by, as I said, you know, birds are not free from the chains of the skyway, but I do not wish to be chained by any man. Now, here is the land use policy of the United Nations. It says land can't be treated as an ordinary asset controlled by individuals and subject to the pressures and inefficiencies of the market. No, no, private land ownership is a principal accumulation instrument for accumulating wealth and concentrating wealth, and therefore, it contributes to social injustice. Public control of land use is therefore indispensable. And what does that mean? It means that right now, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we are fighting 
a huge plan that merges nine counties and 101 cities into a single unit. Our group, my group, is suing to stop this. It is, these plans are all over the United States. They regionalize the area, and most people have no idea that they exist. Most people are completely unaware that they will have no power to determine if they can use their land or not. If you bought a nice piece of land to retire on, you want to build a house on it later, you'll find that if you're outside of a 4% land area in the San Francisco Bay Area, 4% that you cannot build on it. 100% of the structures in rural areas outside of the urban centers in the San Francisco Bay Area has to be rural. 100%. You want to build a house out there? No. You can't do that. Now, these plans are the same plan all over the world. I've got, uh, well, here's the local county below me just south of me, and they have the logo for United Nations Agenda 21 right in their land use plan. The San Francisco plan is the same plan as the Hanoi Capital Regional Plan 2030, Hanoi, Vietnam. So land use plans are used to change and craft the physical built environment, where and how you live, really determines your life. So this cult of new urbanism is a war on rural people, rural people. That's what you're going to find, because what do corporations want? They want a mobile workforce. They want a release of all regulation on moving pr products across boundaries. They don't want boundaries. And they want low wages. So if you're low wages, so if you're living in a high-density apartment in the city center, you don't have any land around you, you're in an apartment, you rent it, you are a mobile person, you can be moved from one place to the other where the jobs are, you can be easily moved, and your wages can be low because you do not have a vehicle, you've got a bicycle. It's a lot cheaper to move you around, and you can be more easily surveilled because you have no private space. Okay, got it? So. No, not yet. After. No. I'll answer everything you, you got, but not right now. Okay, so here we go. This is it. When you restrict single-family home development and you consolidate populations into tight urban centers, you're going to devastate land ownership and land use. And that's nationwide. In China, they've got the so-called ghost cities. Do you know about those? They're building, everybody's like, gee, I wonder what they're doing that for. Gosh, nobody's living there, and there are all these big, tall buildings that they just built. I wonder, oh, okay, now we know. They're moving the rural populations in there against their will. They're relocating the rural populations against their will into these city centers that are built with full surveillance capability. All right, London, Berlin, Milan, other U EU cities all across the world, this high-density apartment block construction is happening often with government subsidies, very often with government subsidies. So, the Wildlands Project. The Wildlands Project is, hey, this is a map of North America. You notice it has no boundaries on it because animals don't know where the boundaries are. The idea is that swaths of land will be identified, huge sections. I mean, I don't know how well you can see this, maybe not too well. This is a project of the World Resources Institute and the Wild Lands Network. It's being implemented through the United States Environmental Protection Agency. This is about creating areas that are huge corridors for animal movement. The spine of the continent takes out about 12 states goes down through most of Mexico and comes up all the way to Alaska. The idea is that... What? The idea is to remove humans and human activity from rural and suburban areas. Agenda 21 is rural cleansing. When you have fires, is it produced through HARP? Possibly. When you have fires, when you have floods, when you're looking at tremendous devastation like you've never seen before, 
oh no, we're not going to let you back in there to build, rebuild your house, because you were living in a national forest, and we bought that land all around you, and now we want you out of there. Why? Because wilderness. What is wilderness identified as? What is wilderness? You think you know, you go out and you take a walk and you think you're in wilderness. Wilderness is an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man. Where man himself is a visitor who does not remain. That's wilderness. That's what wilderness is. Urban people do not understand rural life. Urban people don't understand farming. There's a total disconnect. When you're, how do you get pushed off your land in the rural areas? They monitor your well. They restrict your access. They pulverize your roads to gravel. They stop your postal service. They take away your schools. They don't maintain your bridges. And pretty soon, you're the only one out there paying taxes and you just can't keep doing it anymore. And you say, hey, that economic collapse was engineered, engineered to bankrupt people, engineered to move you into the city centers, get you off your land. Social equity, social equity equalizes the economies of the world, and it's going to have a negative impact. This has a negative impact on the developed nations. If you've got above average expectations, and you do, I guarantee you that you do, because you are not living like the average person in the world. So if you have above average expectations, this plan targets you. It is the corporatocracy, tightening the screws. It's about austerity. It's about artificial scarcity, restriction. So public-private partnerships, allow for the government to get all the advantages of corporations, secrecy, um, you know, uh, no transparency, access to data for spying, no accountability, paying off cronies, and of course, what else public-private partnerships do for the corporations? The corporations then can use the power of the law, police power, to implement their plans. This is perfect. What do we get? We get risk and cost. Domestic spying through Google and Facebook. Do you do Facebook? You know, I'll tell you, if, so, if, if I told you if the government, if I, let's, let's check this out. I'm going to tell you the government is going to require you to carry with you at all times a monitoring device that says where you are and also to tell where, you know, where you are, what you're doing, who, how you're feeling, who you're with, what you're doing, you know, what you eat. And you tell me, no way the government is going to make me do that. Well, they don't have to, do they? What's the most efficient way to manage populations? What's the most efficient way to merge corporations and government? Fascism. If you add in civil society, non-governmental organizations, you've got totalitarianism, okay? So, this is it. Using the cover of the environmental concern that we all have, right? the rigid control of a totalitarian state is in progress right now. And that's what's behind the green mask. That's it. So I said there are two major crises that are being used to implement totalitarianism. The first crisis, climate change. Crisis two, terrorism. 9-11 was the catalyzing event that was used for this purpose. 9-11 was used to terrorize us. They had the Patriot Act all written. This event was created in order to lock down the world. Have you flown lately? Practically have to strip naked. In the U.S., I haven't seen this yet in Europe, but it's coming here. You haven't seen this yet. If you fly right now, you just walk through the metal detector. But in the United States, you get into this big sort of bubble, and you put your hands like this, and it takes a full photograph of your entire body, x-ray, who knows. They, I never do it. I refuse to do it. I opt out. Lady wants an opt out. Woman, woman refuses. Woman opting out here. Woman, woman wants an opt out. Here I am. I'm standing here in my socks. I'm standing in my socks, waiting for somebody to put their hands all over my body. And um, here she comes. 
Nobody will make eye contact with me. They're all getting on the plane. Oh, she must have done something wrong. I'm not talking to her. I'm not going to look at her. She's cut out of the herd. Okay, so the woman, she takes me over. She's like, nah, 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 nah. okay, assume the position. I'm a criminal. I am a criminal. My body is being searched. Okay, so this is what I do when this happens. I say, so, this all you can think of to do for a living? Is there anything you won't do for them? So you just take their money and you do what they say. Is that it? Well, that keeps me in the airport an extra half hour, usually. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, don't cooperate. Okay? Creating a culture of emergency that's linked to human behavior, that enables a wide range of restrictions that are going to benefit a global totalitarian restructuring of the world. All totalitarian states share the same characteristics. Total control of property and means of production, total information, surveillance, of course, loss of free speech. How you like that consensus, huh? Right? Loss of free speech and restricted movement. They also share the same philosophy, and that is it's all for the common good. The individual is selfish. The Spartan present, austerity. Right? Oh, you use too much. You eat too much. Do you really need that big piece of land? What are you doing out there? The vision of the glorious future. Oh, everything's going to be so great when we have sustainable development worldwide. We're all going to be on our bikes. It's never going to rain or snow. There goes the train. Whew. Yeah, life's great. What else do they have in common? All totalitarian states. Terror. The war on terror is a war on you. Revolution is bad for business. Communism, fascism, Nazism, all for the fatherland. It's all for the common good. And as we say in the United States, it's all for the homeland. That's it. This is it. When you look at that smart grid, when you look at smart meters, what you're looking at is a gigantic information tracking and control system designed to control all electric, gas, water, and information systems in the world, including all of your personal data, your healthcare data, everything. This is what it's designed to do. That is the smart grid. Smart, real smart. Smart meters can be shut off remotely. Remember that when you dissent. Three o'clock in the morning, you go to turn your light on, you got nothing. Or you went down and you made a scene at the local government meeting and some, for some reason your water's not working anymore. Right? Surveillance state is essential to implementation of Agenda 21. Essential. The Nazis, this plan is a continuation of the Nazi plan, of the Soviet plan, of the plan, all plans. I don't care if you, you can go back to... Uh, Alexander the Great. Okay, Siemens Corporation. Who's doing it to you? Siemens Corporation. You got a Siemens Corporation thing hanging on your wall or somewhere in your house or you're using Siemens? Siemens Corporation is a Nazi group. Nazi Corporation. Under the, you know, I mean, there were many hundreds of corporations that worked with the Nazis. Siemens was about to go under, was about to go bankrupt when Hitler came to power, and he generously offered them slave labor from the concentration camps, which they, of course, accepted. Now, what does Siemens do? They are in smart meters, the smart grid. They own water, huge, the biggest water in the United States. U.S. filter is owned by Siemens Corporation. They fund the International Council on Local Environmental Initiatives. They funded Growing Smart, they're in high-speed and light rail, Siemens. 
is implementing Agenda 21. IBM, IBM, okay? What did IBM do for the Nazis? Remember the tattoos on the arms? That wasn't just your number one, your number two, your number three. No. IBM created the computer systems for the Nazis so that they could analyze the data, so that they could collect and analyze the data for all of their prisoners. What is IBM doing now? They're working on biometrics to identify you through your eye. You want your money? You want to get your money out of that ATM machine? IBM, okay? GE, General Electric, Smart Grid. This is a continuation of this plan. So, you've got full and total surveillance. You have the ultimate public-private partnerships with prisons. Public-private partnerships and prisons. Privately owned prisons? all over the United States. What do they need? Prisoners. How do you get more prisoners? You make more things crime. And you make criminal sentences longer. Public-private partnerships. Hey, collecting data, you know that the uh, U.S. government did not have enough room in their collection center outside of Baltimore Maryland, they were actually browning out the town of Baltimore because they had so much of a power draw. So they just built out in Utah on a military base a million and a half square feet of data collection centers. All information from and to the United States goes through there. One, one million and a half square feet, that's pretty big. Your data, if you're Transatlantic cables, everything goes right through there, all analyzed instantly. You're not going to see this in the mainstream media. Five corporations own the media. Five mega corporations own the media. Global markets, that's what this is about. In your universities, they're teaching it. UCLA has, for an example, 509 courses on sustainability. This is Bank of America, UC Berkeley, what does it say? Removing the roadblocks. How to make sustainable development happen now. Doesn't that look good? Can't wait to move in there, right? Oh, God. Everyone's in on it. Lawyers, consultants, planners, bicycle coalitions, the Lung Association, unions, Walmart. And you're like, oh, what, is she crazy? Come on. She really is a conspiracy theorist. No, I told you, it's a conspiracy fact. It's not a theory. It's real. This is how it's done. You know, I'm not going to go into it. My book goes into it. I have details, and I don't blame you if you're feeling overwhelmed, because who doesn't? This is a bloodless coup. This, it is, this is an administrative coup d'etat. It's the most brilliant takeover of the world ever, and it is because technology makes it possible. You will not see tanks rolling through your town. It's never going to look like that, unless you're in a third world country, and then they just want to take your stuff and use up their ordinance. No, here it's going to look like it does right now. You'll still vote, you'll have a hollowed out shell, the structure will be gone. Slowly, people will come in from the country into the cities. Pretty soon, you won't have a private vehicle because gasoline costs. And you know, if free energy is made available, they, this is a race to implement this plan fully before those things are available to you. Because, hey, that makes it completely, you know, what, sustainable development? Well, who cares when you're emitting water out of your tailpipe, right? Oh, let's drink it out right out of the tailpipe. No. It's not really about that. It's really about control. So what can you do about it? I want you to know there's a lot you can do. You are powerful. We are powerful. We need to take our power, and we need to do it through education, because most people have never heard of this. And I think they named it Agenda 21 to make it sound crazy. Oh, Area 51, Catch 22. What are you, crazy? So, we've got flyers on our website. Now, don't just like go to sleep. It's not nappy time. These are 
When was the last time you got a flyer with something that really meant something, that was intelligent, that got you, that made you say, hey, something is going on. Why is everyone talking about UN Agenda 21? Well, I'm not. I don't know anything about it. What's wrong with sustainable development? I don't know. Make these flyers. You don't like it? Make your own. They're on our websites. Print them out. There's hundreds of thousands of these out around the United States, many hundreds of thousands, and around the world. People are making these. They're putting them on, get up early in the morning, put them on doorsteps, okay? Put them out there on the doorsteps. Don't try and hand them to people. They're like, no, don't, uh, no, no, no. No, you got to put it on doorsteps. When was the last time you went out in your PJs to get your newspaper and you were like, whoa, this is pretty cool. They're not selling anything, okay? So you want to do that. What else do you want to do? Withdraw your support. Do not willingly collaborate. Expose collaborators. Refuse to volunteer. Volunteerism, now, volunteerism is a big part of this plan. Mandatory volunteerism. Are you a citizen of the community? Are you giving back? What are you doing? Okay, look at who you're volunteering for. Are they supporting sustainable development? Withdraw your support. Do not make contributions. Do not give your time to any group that is pushing sustainable development and high-density development in your city centers. Do not support. You want to kick Ickley out of Copenhagen. Go down there and hang out with your friends and neighbors and fellow human beings in Copenhagen and say, this is happening here. We want to kick Ickley out of Copenhagen. All right, expose the collaborators. Put up wanted posters. So-and-so is collaborating with the enemy. This is how. Link IBM, Siemens, Biometrics, National Defense Authorization Act, domestic surveillance, smart growth, it's all Agenda 21. If your pastor is giving you a talk on sustainable development, you better go have a chat with your pastor. This is our job. Nobody's going to ride in here on a white horse and save us. This is it. This is our job. And you know what? I know that every single one of us, if we had been, if we had been, and maybe some of us were, but if we had been alive during the Nazi takeover, well, we say to ourselves, we would have been in the resistance. There's nobody in this room who thinks they would have gotten up in the morning and put on a Nazi uniform, is there? You all think you would have been in the resistance. This is your time. This is your moment. You are the resistance. This is the resistance. This is the moment that we reach out and we get this information out and we refuse, refuse to be dominated by this plan. We can do it. We are doing it all across the world. Join us. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. Oh, great. Well, not only do you need my website, but you need my book. <laughs> it's easy to read, big print, and uh, it's very basic. It's a good book. Um, and you can get it uh, out there. There's a few. And then on our website, uh, check out postsustainabilityinstitute.org. I know it's, it's almost the longest website address. My other one is the longest website address, and that is Democrats Against UN Agenda 21.com. Boy, is that ridiculous. So just put my name in, okay? And my last name is K O I R E. Just put, just put that into your search engine and, uh, and check it out. It's all in there, and I know that we're gonna, we are gonna do this together. So, got. Got questions, or do we have any time for a question? Yeah, we, we have a little bit of time. I, I have a small comment to what you mentioned, oh, because good. we 
we uh, I didn't know it actually hanged together, but I was uh, listening to Red Eyes Radio with Susanne Pors, mm -hmm. and she talked about how it got more and more difficult in the land actually to get a loan to buy a house. Yes, that's right. So this is also another way of effort, uh, implementing uh, Agenda 21 is mm -hmm. that the banks or the credit institute simply will not bar borrow your money for mm -hmm. some kind of reason, or the interest will be so high, so you don't want to buy the house at the land. So there's a lot of different ways mm -hmm. of doing this. Yeah, that's okay. actually, uh, I actually do talk about that in my book, because yeah, we have definitely a part of it. No? Yes, there is a question. Is it hot in here, or is it me? <laughs> <laughs> mm. <laughs> Rosa, when I... Uh, look at uh, some of the uh, activities going on in the United States in the rural areas. Yeah. For instance, they have crazy uh, gatherings there with a lot of m motorcycles, cars and everything, a lot of beer drinking and whatever they do. So the, uh, watching this, I, I think, um, wouldn't it be a good idea to get some of this activity out of the country, countryside? <laughs> And another thing, can we purge some of the people? <laughs> another thing uh, I'd like to say to you, a friend of mine, she says to herself when she's in the TSA box sitting there being x-rayed or, or opts out of the x-ray and is in for a search, body search, she goes to the TSA guy or a woman, oh yeah, give me a good massage, give me a good work over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, well, I prefer the person of my choice doing that rather than some stranger in a uniform. They hurt you too when you say that stuff to them. They don't like it. I want to thank you for you unveiling this to us in Denmark. I'm very happy because I, I can see tendency in Denmark like you say. But of course it's not so strongly clear in Denmark because we are individual. I, I will ask you, have you done a trial? You know, you go behind these things, and I know I understand. Uh, but could you go to the government, or, or uh, Obama, which I think is sent from the light, and have yeah. a private uh, talk with him about all these things? Oh my, my. <laughs> Oh my my my! Where Why are you laughing? Well, you know, okay, I, I'm I don't I'm not certainly I respect what you say. I am I'm asking you. I hear you. Um, of course, I am an I am the government has made me their enemy. The government has targeted me as their enemy, and in fact, I worked for the government. I was I actually had to leave my job early. The, this I am not a person that any elected official wants to talk to, uh, although I, that isn't entirely true because, in fact, my book, uh, there have been projects around the United States to buy my book in bulk and give it to all of their elected officials, and now elected officials, lower level elected officials, local and Congress, are contacting me, and I have, I did actually make a presentation to the New Hampshire state legislature and, and others. Um, but what I want to say is that President Obama supports Agenda 21. There is no question about that. No question. It's not like Mm -hmm. so no, there's, something wrong in so there's something wrong in Denmark. But I'm very happy to obey this. Mm -hmm. I, I even can go to the government in your country and get the information. I think right to Obama to tell you not to, to be the one to So I, I know system. I know we are ignored. We are also a part of the system in Denmark. This is a, a spiritual movement. To 
Uh huh. Well, good. You know what? You need everyone. Everyone who's working on this works on it in their own way. The point is to do more and to work. Uh, you know, and to continue. This is and whatever your understanding is. The important thing to recognize is that all of these systems are connected, and that the mask is environmentalism. So, thank you. And do we have another question? Yeah, I think we have one over here. Um, like your shirt. It. Thanks. I was uh, recording what you said. Um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for this presentation. It's so important. Um, I knew a lot about this because I researched the New World Order every day, but uh, I learned things uh, through this presentation. But I want to ask you, how do you view, how do you view the, uh, the New World Order and the RFID chip? Because I think that's a big, big part of their plan. I'm sorry, I did not hear, what, I didn't hear that clearly enough. No? Sorry. The question, how do you connect the, um, the RFID chip with the, uh, the New World Order and the Agenda how, 21? How do I connect the government teachers? Is no, that what you said? No, the RFID chip. Oh, the, oh, I'm so sorry. Of course, the RFID chips. Thank you. A great question. And of course, they're essential to this because uh, RFID is, uh, you know, I mean, it's so, these chips are so small, they'll be in every single element of your packaging. They're in your passport. They're in your driver's license, tracking, uh, and also total information. The total information that's contained on those, literally, you cannot change your identity anymore. You know, you used to be, when I was a kid, you could actually hide. You could screw up and you could be somebody else. No, not anymore. Everything is known and you are GPSed. When, you are, when we're talking about, there, there are many things I'd like to go into, but essentially the answer is yes. That is totally, completely integral to implementation of this plan. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> uh, short question. Now I, I missed the first part of the presentations. I don't know if you talked about this earlier, but I want to know if you believe in global warming, and if that case, how do you think we should deal with that issue? Uh huh. Well, that's good. Well, you know what? You know, I don't believe. Let's see. What about belief? Belief. Let's talk about belief. <laughs> Tooth fairy? No. People say to me, do you believe in Agenda 21? I'm like, what is this, the tooth fairy? I'm talking about something real here. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Now, global warming, as I say in my book, whether it's true or not, it's certainly a fabulous vehicle for this plan. I am not a scientist. I have read a lot of documentation. It appears that this is a manipulation. But I am not qualified, so what I will say is that it is being used as a way to implement a system of full control and surveillance. And if it wasn't that, it would have been something else. Hi. Uh, I'm just curious. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just curious about because I hear so much about this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is wrong. But what are the alternatives? Mm -hmm. And is is there any research or something? How do you know this is like a good alternative or not? Alternative to sustainable development? Yeah. Mean? To everything that's wrong. Well, to this. Well, I think freedom is a great alternative to slavery. I pick that one any time. Okay. <laughs> Now, um, as I said, uh, and I, I think I understand your question. Okay, my partner, um, Kay, is a general contractor. We've been together for like 21 years or something like that. She's a general contractor, and uh, she, she's built whole houses out of um, recycled materials. Um, I do not own, I've owned very little that's brand new. Everything I get is recycled, owned by somebody else channeling all that good energy. Um, and that's great. I'm into that. I'm into, uh, you know, creative reuse, recycling, you know, cons conservation of, of water or whatever that I'm using, you know, mindful, mindful. But what we're talking about is the green mask, okay? So what, rather than posing a solution to a problem that maybe doesn't exist, what we want to look at is what, who we are as human beings. What our ideal is for us as human beings. What our expectations are. 
in terms of ourselves as individuals and our relationship to the world. And that is the way that we want to think. You know, if we are wasteful, if we're polluting, we want to clean that up. Now, the corporations, you cannot punish me if a corporation is providing material to me that I, you know, I mean, I bought this. It's all that's available, let's say, in my store. Now, this is where our participation is important because we say, well, we want recyclable materials. But this is just the face of it. This entire plan is about management, manipulation, inventory, and control of everything on the planet. Okay. Oh, we have another question. Sorry, I have a question. Um, regarding resistance and knowledge about all these things, the internet and um, surve surveillance uh, by Facebook, mm -hmm. can't we use it the other way around? There's a lot of resistance on Facebook mm -hmm. and on the internet. Yes, very good. And, you know, I, I mean, I personally uh, have dedicated my life to this. I, and I mean that in a very uh, real sense, where I have given up, you know, I mean, I just came from Budapest and saw the Terror Museum in Budapest. I mean, I I am willing, I'm sure I'll, I told Kay, I said, hey, you got about 20 seconds before I rat you out totally if there's, if there's any torture going around. I'm probably going to break instantly. But the thing is that we, you know, if we use media, in other words, we have to recognize that we have no secrets. That, in fact, your, your postal service is photographing every piece of mail so they know who's writing to you and who you're writing to. Now, they can't read the inside of that, but they know who is co corresponding with you. We have very little places where we can be secret. That's another reason why we need our private vehicles and our private homes. And we need places where we can get together, strategize, discuss tactics, and work on this. And yes, if you do use electronic media, use it. Use it. Get this information out there. I do not have a Facebook page, but many, many people who uh, know about me and g have this information, get it out to people. This is our, you know, if you, if you want to use that, absolutely do it. Make, uh, you know, those QR or whatever, QVR or whatever those things are, you know, those little stickers that you can put your smartphone up to. Make those and have them connected to our site or other sites that are telling the truth about this information. This is the information age. We are in a moment now where no one's holding a gun to our head yet. This is our time. Those of us who are free and who are willing to take the risk to speak out and tell the truth need to take this moment and use it. So yes, use your electronic media, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Let's see. Is that? I wow. think we have one more question. One more, okay. Yeah. And that's the I last actually one. could stay here all day, and I, I'm I'm happy to talk with anyone. Hi, um, Hi. I just wanted to thank you for uh, a great lecture. Um, it was really nice to have someone connect the dots because this is really a very complicated, mm -hmm. um, and it was very nice to kind of put the, the things in, in perspective and connect all the the corporations and, and everything. It was really nice. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you. No question. <laughs> that was easy. I got off easy on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, I think we should give Rosa oh. one more applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank and, you, Frank. Uh, huh? And uh, Rosa will also be available if any of you have some questions uh, regarding this or other thing, I'm sure. So um, we have five minutes break and then we will go on to show you an app who is trying to help uh, coming up with solutions on environmental problems. So we are also here in Open Mind Conference trying to present solutions as well as problems. And now Great. you will have a solution. Excellent. Five minutes. <laughs>